Our next speaker is uh, Ron Goldman, a professor at uh, Rice University. He's an expert on uh, subdivision and geometric modeling, and uh, we have a personal relationship. He's actually the first person I did research with as an undergraduate at Rice University. We did several papers together at Boston. And he's going to talk about one topic that he's an expert on, um, uh, pyramid algorithms. Thank you. So about a dozen years ago or more, I was teaching a course on geometric modeling on curves and surfaces. Trying to come up with a way of unifying the subject so I didn't have to very curve a surface, I didn't have to introduce a new method of looking at matters. And the idea I came up with is this is pyramid algorithms. So I'm going to talk about that today, and it's based on this nice book that I wrote for my class called Pyramid Algorithms. The good news is that this has been translated into Chinese, so <laughs> <laughs> it says the bad news is it has not been translated into German. Just let me know. All right. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, Etienne had said he had a three hour lecture to condense to an hour and a half. I have a book I'm going to condense to an hour. So, of course, I'm not going to cover everything in the book. The idea is to whet your appetite, and if you're interested, the material is all in the book. So, uh, you'll see that I skip through some slides because I can't cover everything, but uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. So, the main idea here is that mathematics is easy. You see, I teach on computer science students, and they're afraid of mathematics. So I tell them mathematics is easy, especially for curves and surfaces. Because all that's going to be involved, involved here, see, we have complicated curves and surfaces, but all you have to know is uh, linear interpolation. What's linear interpolation? Well, when I was in high school, I had to learn linear interpolation because we had we have tables of signs. It's going to all sound very archaic. We had tables of signs and logarithms, and you had to find values in between. So they computed up to four decimal places. And could back. We didn't have computers. Okay, that's how old I am. So we have to do linear interpolation. You probably never had that. But all linear interpolation is is, is that. You know, how do you get from here to here when you draw a straight line? If you can do that, you can understand basically all the curves and surfaces. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to talk about interpolation and approximation. We'll talk about Lagrange interpolation, Bezier approximation, these lines. And they all have these algorithms, different algorithms, but they're all pyramid algorithms. And all they are is linear interpolation. On, well, lots of linear interpolation, as we'll see. All right, so that's the idea. All right, so we'll start with interpolation, because conceptually it's the easiest. But you've probably heard about Bezier approximation, about these lines and nerves and things like that. We'll go into that as well. So, okay, here's the simplest case. I have two points. I want to draw a curve between them. The simplest curve is a straight line. I want to write down an equation. Okay? Well, here we can write down an equation. And you see if t is 0, then you get p. And if t is 1, this goes away and you get q. Okay, so that's pretty easy. We have the equation of a line. Now, what that says is if I think about t as time, then time 0, and then p, and then time 1, and then q. But maybe I want to be at p at time t0 and at q at time t1. So instead of 0 and 1, I want t0 and t1. Okay. So I want to write down the equation like I had before, but now instead of having t here, I'm going to have f of t here. Okay. And f of t now should have the following properties. At t0, I should get 0, so I'm going to get p0. And at t1, I should get 1, so I'm going to get t1. Okay. So at t0, I have to be 0. At t1, I have to one, so I need this line in the, uh, in the ty plane, and I probably learned in high school how to write that down. And if you did, you can see that this certainly satisfies the property. If t0, you get 0. t1, you get 1. So that's f. That's what I'm going to put in there. So that's f. And now here's my equation of the line. So at uh, t0, that goes away. That becomes 1. You get t0. And uh, t1, that goes away. That becomes 1. You get p1 or q. That's the equation of the line. And you know it, uh, it's easy to write down, and it just depends on p0 and p1 and these, these t values. And it's the line I've drawn here. The line I've drawn here. And it depends on the endpoints. So if I move the endpoints, I have a fine line cursor. And I move the endpoints. Then, of course, the line comes along. Interpolates the endpoints. So no mystery there. Okay. This is basically all you have to know. Yeah, let's see. 
Okay, so I like to draw diagrams. Equations are kind of, uh, okay, if you write down equations, I like very visual. So I'm going to diagram the equations. So I diagram it this way. So this picture just means this. So as it say, it takes, take this point and multiply it by this function, take this point, multiply it by this function, and the results, put them here. And so this is just a diagram of this formula, okay? okay? Now, this diagram is a little cluttered because of these denominators, so I'm going to remove the denominators and draw this picture, this diagram. So I can easily recover the denominator of t1 minus t0 because if I add these two functions, I get t1 minus t0. So I don't have to write down the denominator, I can recover it from this picture. So when I write down this picture, I mean this picture. And when I write down this picture, I mean this formula. So instead of formulas, now we're going to have these pictures. OK? Now, of course, for this example, it's trivial, but let's go on to something a little more interesting. Suppose I have three points. And now I want a curve that interpolates all three points. Well, of course, I could draw this straight line. And I could draw this straight line and have something that's piecewise linear. But then it comes to a point. And if I manufacture things that come to a point and people bump up against them, I get sued. They hurt. So I want a smooth curve that goes through all three. So I want a t0, I should get p0, a t1, I should get p1, a t2, I should get p2. So how do I draw, how do I compute a formula with such a smooth curve? Well, to get the lines, I did linear interpolation on the points. So get the curve, I'm going to do linear interpolation on the lines. So this line goes through p0 and p1, this goes through p1 and p2, canceling the interpolation again. I claim this curve will go through all three points. We can check that. Let's see what happens. At t0, this goes away, this becomes 1, and you get this function, but this function interpolates p0 and p0. At t2, this goes away, this becomes 1, and then this function interpolates p2 and t2. What about p1? Well, both of these interpolate p1 and t1. So you get this, and now these two coefficients sum to 1, so you get p1. So sure enough, this curve goes through all three points, and you get a picture like this. Well, there's the curve that goes through all three points. It's a parabola, it's a polynomial. If I move the point, right, the curve still interpolates the parabola. Okay, very good. Let's try for four points. Oh, that's three points. So that's my diagram now. So these are the linear interpolants. This is the degree two interpolant. It's just linear interpolation on the linear interpolants. Let's go for four points. There's four points. Okay. Now I want a curve that interpolates all four points. What am I going to do? Well, I already have a curve that goes through three of the points, right? So here's a curve that goes through the first three points. Here's the curve that goes through the last three points. And notice they share this node. They share this node. So I can paste them together. And now you should have a strong urge, a strong urge to complete the, uh, the diagram, right? So how would you complete that? Well, what is going to be labeled on this arrow? Well, here you have one, two, so it must be three. And here you have, uh, what do we have here? Two, one, so it must be zero, right? There's a God in heaven, this is going to work. So we're going to try this algorithm. So this says link, take the quadratic interpolants and do linear interpolation this way, and you get this guy. Is that going to work? We can check. Well, here's our formula again. So let's see, at t0, this is 0, this is 1, so you get p0. At, uh, at 3, this is 0, this is 1, you get p3. What about p1 and p2? Well, these both interpolate. So let's say at t1, this one is p1, this one is p1. The coefficient is something when you get p1. And the same thing will work for p2. So yeah, it works. And now you get something that interpolates uh, four points. It looks like that. And again, we can move the points. And the curve will come along, right? Because it's forced to interpolate the points wherever they are. Wherever <coughs> they are. Yeah, OK, good. So we have something that interpolates four points. And of course, this doesn't just work for degree 2 or degree 3, it works quite generally. So the theorem says if I have an interpolant that interpolates n points, 0 to n minus 1, that's n points, 1 to n, that's n points, I can paste the two, linear, the two <coughs> interpolants together and get an interpolant that interpolates n plus 1 points. And the proof is the same, right? At t0, this is 0, this is 1, so you get p0. At tn, 
this is zero, this is one, you get Tn, and both of these interpolate all the other points, so at Tk you get Pk, coefficient sum to one. So this works quite generally, and so this, uh, this equation, is, or this algorithm, if you like this called Noah's algorithm, if we take this literally, this says to compute for this function, I should have a call for this function and a call for this function. And so my algorithm would look something like this. And to compute this guy, I call this guy, and I call this guy. Now to compute this guy, I call these two, compute this guy, I call these two. And uh, notice this is wasteful because this guy gets called twice. And also it's an exponential algorithm, right? I have an exponential number of calls. If I have degree n, I have two to the n calls. So this is, this is called, technically this is called bad. So good would be this, is what I showed you before. This is dynamic programming. First you compute the linear interpolants, then you compute the quadratic interpolants, then you compute the cubic, and you can go on and on. So this is, this is polynomial algorithm, where n squared this is much better. And this is Neville's algorithm. All right, so a few words about Neville's algorithm. Let's see. Something very nice about it. So it only uses the data directly. So it's a polynomial. But you don't have to compute the coefficients in this basis. You're just using the data directly down here. In fact, you don't have to know anything about uh, coefficients or bases or anything, right? It's polynomial because all I'm doing is multiplication and addition. So it's definitely a polynomial. Right? But I don't have to know anything about the number of coefficients or the bases. It's an uh, order n squared algorithm, so it's sufficient. Uh, how do you remember the indices? How do I remember what these indices are? Well, notice, by the way, that if you look at parallel arrows, they have the same indices. In the numerator, the denominators are different. The denominator down here is what? Uh, T3 minus T2. The denominator here is T3 minus T1. But the numerators are the same, and I can recover the denominators from the numerators. So if you can label the bottom level, then you can label all the other levels by the parallel property. And the bottom is easy to label because it's just linear interpolation. That's one way to remember it. If you can't remember that, then look here. How do you find this? Well, you strip off the last index, that goes here. Strip off the first index, that goes here. Strip off the last index, strip off the first index. So it's easy to remember. Many mnemonics for remembering this algorithm. Okay? So it's easy to remember. And finally, it's easy to update. So here, they gave me four points. Suppose they gave me a fifth point. So now I have to go through this fifth point. All this computation is okay. All I have to do is add on another, uh, another uh, row here. So this computation remains the same. So you can keep the computation. Okay. So you can do as many points as you like. That's all very nice. But there is something nasty about this. The algorithm is nice, but uh, if you look at this uh, at the curve here, and it goes through all the points, it goes to this point, but then it overshoots because it has to come down and go up to that point. Even this one, it overshoots before it gets there. So it's uh, a little bit strange, and if you look at the other examples, it looks even stranger. But just, I take all these points, okay, so a straight line interpolates all those points. Well, let's move one of the points, say the middle one, and now look what happens. Sure, I interpolated all the points, but uh, who told me to go down here? The data is flat and goes up. Why did I go down here? Why did I go up there? Right? But that's an artifact of interpolation. If you do polynomial interpolation, that's what happens. Okay. So maybe interpolation is not such a nice thing. In fact, if you're doing design, it's not so important to go through all the points. What's important is to get the shape, more or less, right? So the shape is kind of flat, then goes up, then comes down. That's what I really want. So maybe I shouldn't use Lagrange interpolation. Maybe I should try something else. I'm going to skip circumstances to now. It's a great time when I'm back. So we're going to try something else. This is Bezier, probably heard of Bezier curves and surfaces. Let's try Bezier approximation. So the idea here is I don't want this to happen. Right? If this is my data, then this is kind of what I want to happen. I'm not going to insist on going through all the points, because that's what I get. But I'll insist on getting the shape right. So it should kind of go up and then kind of go down. If it didn't go up high enough, then I'll just pull that, that point higher. Uh, my, my approximation is right, this is where it should follow. So let's see if we can build things like this. I think that builds things like, uh, like this rather than things like this. Okay, so here's Neville's algorithm. And the thing that makes Neville's algorithm a little bit, just a little bit complicated, is that all the indices and all the, on all the edges are a little bit different. So uh, let's make it easier. So here's linear interpolation again. Now this is between A and B, right? So 
when p is a, I get b0, and p is b, I get uh, p1. So this is just the same thing interpolation I showed you before. Here's my diagram for it again. Now, let's just do the same linear interpolation everywhere. Let's not change the indices. Let's just have B and A everywhere, right? So it's easy to remember, right? And this has a name. It's called the Castogeos algorithm. So a lot of, and now we're going to restrict T between A and B. The reason for that is uh, if T is between A and B, then all these uh, combinations are convex. That is, they're all non-negative. So I get convex combinations. So it's very stable numerically. This is called Neville's algorithm, and this is, uh, this is um, what comes out the top is Bezier curve. I, I've showed you cubics, but you can, obviously you can do this for any degree. Just keep going higher and higher, just doing the same linear interpolation all the time. Usually you take a to be 0 and b to be 1, so it's even simpler. Even simpler. Sometimes you need to vary a to b, but usually you take a to be 0 and 1. So this is this is Lebrun, this is uh, Picasso Jose algorithm. T is between 0 and 1, and these are the points. Okay. So maybe I should show you a picture. Okay. So there's a typical Bezier curve. This is, again, a parabola. It's quadratic. I move the point. The curve comes along. It follows. It doesn't go through the point, but it follows. It does interpolate the last point and the first point. We'll see why later. But it follows. That was, a, that was a degree two. Here's degree three. Again, if I move the point, the curve kind of follows along, right? It doesn't go through the point. It's the, mid, the interior, the middle point, so it kind of follows along. So that's kind of nice. And if I do that horrible example I showed you before with the Lagrange interpolation, now we won't do interpolation. But if we move this point, the curve behaves rather, rather nicely, right? It just comes up. And if I don't, it didn't go high enough, I can just push that further. I can pull other points, and the curve comes along. Right. So it's behaving much more nicely than the curve behaved with the Lagrange interpolation. That is, if I'm interested in shape, you know, if the, curve, if the points aren't sacred to me, if I'm just interested in getting the shape right, this is a lot better than I got with Lagrange interpolation. So that's why people are interested in Bezier approximation. And also, the algorithm is pretty much trivial. Just linear interpolation repeated again and again and again. Again, this is just cubics, but you can do it in degrees. Right? Same algorithm. Okay. So, uh, okay, it's so polynomial. I'm just doing multiplication and addition. Uh, it has, uh, well, let's see, it lives in the convex all of its control points because I'm just taking convex combinations. It has some other properties. Let's see, I'll prove, I can prove all these properties, by the way, just from the diagram. In fact, let me prove the interpolation property. You saw that the curve interpolated the first and last points. It's easy to show that. Let's, uh, let's prove that one. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's see what happens. What happens when t is a? So when t is a, this is zero. And remember, this is divided by b minus a. So this is one. So the value here is the same as the value here. This is zero. This is one. So this value is the same as here. This is zero. This is one. So this value is the same here. So the value here is the same as the value here. And therefore, t equals a. I interpolate p zero. The same thing with t is b. This is zero. This is one. So these values are the same, and so the curve interpolates p one. So and you can reason with other properties of the algorithm just from just from this diagram. And I'll show you a few more in a minute. Yeah. So this is interpolation of the endpoints. Skip surfaces. We'll come back to that later. Uh, Okay, I want to talk about subdivision. So you may have heard about subdivision as uh, a way of generating curves and surfaces. Let's talk about Bezier subdivision. It's kind of the simplest subdivision that shows up. So here's my algorithm again. Here's the new cast of your algorithm. Okay, and here's the idea of subdivision. I have this curve. Right? It's a polynomial <coughs> curve. It's a piece of a polynomial. Right? So Bezier curves are polynomials, but we restrict to some equal a to b. So it's just a piece of a polynomial. Now, this piece from here to here is also a piece of a polynomial, and also from here to here. So this piece should be a Bezier curve. That means it should have some control points that define it. And same thing for that part. So I should be able to split this curve into two Bezier curves, one from here to here, and one from there to there. So there should be control points, the Qs, that define
define this part of the curve, and the r's that define this part of the curve. And the question is, given the p's that define the original big segment, how do you find the q's and the r's that define the shorter segments? And the answer is actually quite elegant. You can just read it off the, uh, off the de Kastinger algorithm. It's here. So here's the algorithm for, for computation, and here the q's live. They always live on this edge. And here the r's live. They always live on that edge. And that's it. That's the q's and the r's. So I'll prove this to you in a little while, but trust me for a minute. And uh, that's the q's and the r's. Now the point about the q's and the r's is that they're closer to the curve than the original p's. Now I can iterate this. I can take the q's and the r's, and I can apply subdivision to them. And I get things that are closer and closer. So I can use this algorithm, the subdivision algorithm, to say render the curve. But the Bezier curve can be approximated, say, by uh, the straight line during the first and last points, because we always know the curve goes through the first and last points. Then you just draw that line. Right? Or you can draw the control polygon, it doesn't matter. Otherwise, subdivide at a half, or really at any other value, it doesn't matter. Right? And then render the pieces recursively. And that converges very quickly. I'll show you some examples. Let's look at this, this example first. I'll show you the subdivision algorithm. Back here. Uh, so here's one level of subdivision. So now I split the curve into two pieces. So this piece and this piece, this is the Q's and this is the R's. And now I can iterate that. I can subdivide this piece and subdivide that piece. If I do that, then I get this. Pretty close. Subdivide again, get that. And you can't really tell the difference anymore between the curve and the control plot. Subdivide again, you can see. In fact, I'll remove the curve. That's just the control polygon, so that's like the curve. I can back this up and start again. Here's the original control polygon, one level of subdivision, two, three, it already looks smooth, four, that's the curve. Okay. So it's a very quick way of rendering. You don't even have to evaluate points on the curve. You just do subdivision several times, and you can draw the curve. And you do that for any curve, any Bezier curve. Here's this more complicated guy. We can subdivide this guy. Right, this is one, two, three. Four, five, degree six. There's one level of subdivision. Two, three, four. You can't tell the difference between the polygons and the curve. So this is a very efficient way to draw the curve. You can also use this to intersect two curves. So remember, the curve lives in the convex hull of its control points. So if the convex hull is the, of the two curves don't intersect, then the curves don't intersect. So you're done. Otherwise, if the curves can be approximated by straight lines, and reset to straight lines, that's easy to do. And if neither that's true, then subdivide and do it to the pieces recursively. And what happens is eventually you get pieces where the control polygons, their convex hulls don't intersect, you throw them away, and you narrow down on some place where they do intersect, and eventually you approximate by straight lines and intersect the straight lines. So this is a very powerful method for, say, analyzing Bezier curves. Okay, and that works. 
you line them up to differentiate one more, differentiate that level. So that's how you differentiate basic curves. Again, you don't have to know formulas, you just have to apply this to the algorithm. Why this works will explain it. Okay. So if you want to differentiate k times, then you differentiate k levels. By the way, uh, when I differentiated twice, I differentiated that level and that level. So I couldn't differentiate that level and that level. It also would work. Differentiate any two levels. It doesn't matter. This doesn't work for Lagrangian percolation, by the way. It's a special property of this here. to see why I do. Okay. So uh, that's how this kind of differentiate. You want to differentiate k times, differentiate k levels, and multiply by those magic factors. Now here's something interesting. If I want the derivatives, suppose I want to connect two Bezier curves. So here I have a, <coughs> yeah, well suppose I have two Bezier curves. So uh, this is my yeah, P and Q. So uh, I, want, I want to attach them at their endpoints. So at the, at zero, right, this thing calculates there. At, at zero, the derivative interpolates P1 minus P0, and the second derivative interpolates that. At one, we also get interpolation conditions. And now if you want to have two pairs that join, then at zero, right, so you have P's and Q's <coughs> and your control points. So the Q curve, right, his, uh, his first point has to be the same as his last point, so that at least join C0. Then the first derivatives have to match, right? This is the first derivative at the end point of the P curve. This is the first derivative at the start point of the Q curve. These must match. So you can solve for Q1, you already have Q0, you get that. And similarly, you can solve for Q2. So this tells you where to position points so that you can match up two curves with as much smoothness as you want. If I just took these three conditions, I would get C2. So this tells me how to join curves smoothly. I think that's all I want to tell you about Bezier curves. So uh, let's move on to, uh, to uh, these lines. So I think that's all about Bezier. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go on to these lines. Concrete in a minute. So how do you define blossoming? 
So here I am going to write down axioms. Oh God, I'm not petitioning, so I write down axioms, but don't worry. Don't worry, it's not too bad. So we start with a polynomial of degree n in, in one variable, and we're going to write down something else of degree 1 in n variables. And this new guy, so this is the polynomial you're trying to say, this new guy has the following property. He's symmetric, so the order of the parameters doesn't matter. It's very simple. He's affine in each parameter. Right? So in each parameter, he looks like this. In each parameter. So he's almost linear. He's affine in each parameter. And finally, you can get back, if you know the little p, you can get back the big p by just replacing all the u's by t. And this thing, this little guy, is called the blossom of the big guy. So I showed you if you have, if you knew the little guy, you can get back the big guy. But it's also true if you know the big guy, you can get the little guy. It's not so obvious here, but I'll show you this in a minute. Now the point, though, is that you never actually compute this guy. You never compute him. You just use him. The fact, the fact that he has these properties is enough. What, how this formula is is completely irrelevant. Nevertheless, I'm going to show you how to compute him. I know you're nervous. Okay, so a few things. This, this little guy exists. Right? I mean, these axioms since then, maybe he doesn't even exist. But sure enough, he does exist in his unique. And uh, what does the multi affine property mean? It just means that these u's only appear to the first power. So you never see a u squared. You don't see u1 squared or u2 cubed or anything like that. You could see u1 times u2. That's okay. But no squares, no squares. Very simple. And uh, oh, the reason that this guy is important is if you go back to Bezier curves and you take this little blossom guy and you evaluate it at the a's and b's at the endpoints of the parameter interval, you get back the k control point. So if you have all A's here, you get back P0. If you have all B's here, you get back P1. So there's a deep connection now between Blossom and Bezier curves. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Now let's see. Let's actually compute Blossom just to make sure we can do it if we wanted to. They held a gun to your head. You can compute Blossom, but nobody's ever going to hold a gun to your head. <laughs> all right, let's see if we can compute the Blossom of this. I claim the blossom of this is this. Let's check. Is it symmetric in the u's? Yeah. Do any u's appear squared? No. Nope. And if you replace all the u's by t, do you get back one? Yeah. It's the blossom. That was too easy. Let's try this one. It's symmetric. No squares. And if you replace all the u's by t, you get 3t divided by 3, you get back t. Let's try this one. It's symmetric. No squares. You're allowed to multiply the u's, just not to square them. And uh, if you replace all these by t, you get 3t squared over 3, you get t squared. And finally, t cubed. This is symmetric, no squares, and you replace all the u's by t, so you get that t cubed. So that works. So we, we showed how to compute the blossom. Now, if you have any cubic, then by linearity, that's the blossom. Now, I just did this for cubics, but you can do this for any degree. And what you're having on the side, of course, is just the elementary symmetric functions times the new constant. So you can do it. Never do it. Never do it. If you don't need to. This is just to prove to you you could and make you less nervous than this is a rough scratch. But you're never going to do this. You're just going to use the fact that this, this is sort of proof of existence. If you like. The fact that it exists is enough. That's all you ever need. All right, we're going to diagram this. I love to diagram these formulas, right? So we're going to diagram this. So here's P of T. Here's how I diagram. Or here's a linear function. Here's how I diagram it. That's my de passage algorithm. I'm going to show you the connection between Blossom and de passage though. So let's see. Okay. So uh, here is linear interpolation again. Right? When t is a, this is 0, this is, this is a. When t is b, right, then uh, this goes away and you get b. This is linear interpolation. So you can, this, in fact, uh, this is an identity, right? So this is t. If you multiply it out, you get t. Okay, so there we are. And now the multi-affine property says if I want to evaluate this, I can replace t by this, by this, and then expand. Right? So this will multiply this, and you, know, you can replace t by a, you multiply by this, replace t by b, you multiply by that. So the multi-affine property says I can compute that by computing that, multiplying by this coefficient, compute that, multiply by this coefficient, add, you get that. That's the multi-affine property. Now, I don't like this diagram too many p's, so I just write it this way. When I write three a's, I mean p evaluated three a's. When I write this, I mean p evaluated there. When I write this, I mean p evaluated there. Just simple shorthand. And why it's easy to remember because if you 
So this notation means that. Now, if you multiply this formula by a a, you get this times three a's, and you get this times two a's and a b. That's right. So it's an easy, it's a mnemonic. Right? It's an easy way to remember what this should be. You take this formula and multiply by a a. But it really comes out of the multi-affine property of velocity. Anyway, we're going to draw diagrams like this. When I draw this diagram, I mean these are velocity values. I mean this. And I draw this, I mean, uh, I mean the multi-affine property of velocity. Are you with me? Everybody seems to object. Okay. <laughs> here it goes. Now we're ready for the Decassa job. Now what do we have here? Here we have one of my little triangles, right? And that's the, that's this, this triangle here, right? Three A's, two A's and a B. That's this triangle. But you can do the same thing here. Now we have A and B are the same. And you write plus NT in terms of AD, you get this little triangle. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. All right, so here I just rewrite the little T in terms of A and B. So the double T's came up. So here, things that are the same come up, and then you take one that's different and you interpret it. So that's the de Castle job. This is exactly the de Castle job. Up here is TTT. That's the value of the polynomial at T. That's the diagonal property. And what's down here? Let's see the control points. Let's see the control points. So the control points are the blossom evaluated at A's and B's. That's the control points. That's the connection between blossom and the capacity of Now we can do subdivision. How does subdivision work? Well, if I want the coefficients with respect, uh, I want the Bezier coefficients for the parameter to A and B, there are three A's, two A's and a B, and two B's, three B's. Now, if I subdivide, I need, the co I need these guys. I need three A's, two A's and a T, A and two T's, three T's. I need that. I can just read that up the diagram. Let's see. Here's the diagram. Three A's, two A's and a B, A and two B's, three B's. Three A's, two A's and a T, A and two T's, three T's. That's the left, that's, that's, that's the left part of subdivision. That's subdivision between A and T. Right? Three A's, two A's and a T. And two T's, three T's. And here, three T's, two T's and a B, two B's and a T, three B's, that's, that's the Bezier coefficients from uh, T to B. So these are the original Bezier coefficients in terms of the velocity value. This is left subdivision, that's right subdivision. So it's kind of like stealing. Right? We didn't have to do any work. Right? We just read off the answer. Right? That's the point about velocity. You don't compute it, you just use it. Right? We didn't compute it, we just used it. The fact that it existed was enough to tell us that that's subdivision. That's how you use velocity. We never compute the formula for velocity. Okay, let's put that. I want to show you one more trick, because I got to show you differentiation. So here's another trick. It's called homogenization. So here's a polynomial. That's a nice polynomial, but you see it doesn't have this nice property. It's a polynomial degree n. So if you multiply t by c, you do not expect c to the end, because there are a lot of terms. So you don't have this nice formula. And the same thing here. This guy, the velocity is not linear. It's affine, so you can't just pull the c out. It's, it's affine. So we'd like to be able to do that. That would make our life simpler. So we're going to simplify p by throwing in another parameter. It's called homogenizing parameter. So instead of one variable, now we have two variables. And we just throw this in to make this the total degree here n. So every term now has degree n. When I see t to the k, I multiply by w to the n minus k. And so every term now has degree n. So if I multiply both c, both p and w by c, I get c to the k and c to the n minus k, and that's c to the n, and I can pull it out. And so now I do have that nice formula, because everything is homogeneous of the same degree. I can do the same thing with blossoming. For each parameter now, I'm going to replace, I'm going to use two parameters, the u and the v, the u and the v. This was linear in, uh, it was affine in u, I throw the v in, and now I can pull out the c. Well, I'll show you examples in a minute. We didn't do this right. And now if you want, if you have this guy and you want to recover this guy, it's easy. Just set w to v1, and you'll get back the original polynomial. The same thing here, if you want the original uh, blossom, just set all the v's to v1, and you'll get back the original blossom. Let's make sure this works. Let's try some examples. Uh, let's do this one. So here, here is our original polynomial. We want to make it a cubic, so it looks like that. 
here's our blossom. Now, uh, what are we going to do when we, when we see u? We're happy, but we don't see u2 or u3, so we can multiply by the v's. So if I don't see a v here, I multiply by v2 and v3. If I don't see uh, u1 here, then I have to multiply by v1. So this is the homogeneous version. Right? So I made everything degree 3, and now you can see several things that if I replace uh, uv by tw, I'm going to get back that. So tw, so I get tw squared, tw squared, tw squared, tw squared, and we get that back. Right? So this is the homogeneous version that we do this. And I replace the v's by 1, I'll get back this. Do the same thing here. I make this degree 3, putting a w there. This is my original blossom. Now where I don't, here I have u1 and u2, I don't see u3, so I put a v3 there. Here I don't see u1, so I put a v1 there. So every term either has u1 or v1, but never both. And so if I multiply u1 v1 by a constant, the constant would multiply this one, and this one, and this one, and we pull that. Okay. So that's the idea behind homogenization. OK, so it made things a little simpler. Now why do I do this? Because it leads me to show you how to differentiate. <coughs> So suppose I want to differentiate this curve. Well, that's hard, but here's my blossom, and these are equivalent. These are equivalent. So I differentiate this is the same as differentiating this. Now I can differentiate this by the chain rule. Here's the chain rule. So these are u's, and all the u's are t. The so chain rule says that the derivative of this is dp du du dt, summed over all u's. The u dt is 1, right, because the u's are t. So all I have to compute is dp du. How do I compute du? Let's go back and look at the, say, the last one. Now, how do I compute the derivative of this with respect to u1? Well, if I differentiate u1, I get a 1 here, I get zeros here. Which means I should replace u1 by 1. And if I was smart, I would replace v1 by 0. That would fill up these terms. Same thing here. If I want to differentiate this with respect to u1, I put a u1 here. I put a 1 here for u1. A 1 here for u1. And this time I have to kill, so I can replace v1 by v0. And I'll do it. I have to replace the other u's by t. So that's what I'm going to do. That's what this formula says. It says, uh, replace, I'm differentiating with respect to uk, replace uk by 1, replace vk by 0, and all the other u's get replaced by t. And that's it. And do that for every, every u and sum. But this is symmetric. So if I sum, I'm just going to get the same thing n times. And that is the derivative of the polynomial in terms of the blossom. It says take the original blossom and just put one of the parameters to be this, this delta, this 1 comma 0. And if I want to differentiate more times, just put more deltas in there. And that's it. Oh, there's some magical constant here that we saw before. That's every time you differentiate, you multiply by n and minus 1. OK, so that's how we differentiate the blossom. Now here's our uh, decastage our algorithm. <coughs> how are we going to differentiate it? Well, at the top, instead of getting t, 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 we should get t, t, delta. So I've got to get a delta in there. OK, so delta is given by this. So 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay? And then b minus a by b minus a is 1. So here's the formula for delta. Now, our blossom is linear, because we homogenized. Right? So remember, there's a, there's a b minus a down here. So to get delta in, I just do this, and then I subtract these two, and I get delta. And now I do the same thing I did before, the Kassel job, and I get that. But what have I really done here? I just differentiated this level. Right? So inserting delta is exactly like differentiating. That's what I showed you last time. When I differentiate twice, put two deltas in. Differentiate this little, differentiate this level. Right? So that's how you differentiate. OK, so uh, let's do a few things. OK, so these are the principal properties of blossom. Here you have their axioms. Here are the differentiation formula. And here you have the relationship between uh, the SA curves and the, uh, and the control points and the blossom value. OK, so good. So I have some time to do these lines. OK, so let's say a word about these lines, about Bezier curves. So why Bezier curves are so nice. Why do we have to go to these lines? You may have heard nerve. So that means rational these lines. And I'm why do we do that? Well, there's some problems, let's say. If you have one polynomial, so you think you can build a car with one polynomial? It seems unlikely, right? It seems unlikely. So, uh, 
it's unnatural to design. Right? So, uh, I also, okay, maybe I'll use many polynomials and stick them together. I showed you with Bezier curves I could do that. Right? I had one polynomial Bezier curve with the P control points, and I had another one with the Q control points. I showed you how to pick the Q control points so the Q curves would be smoothly. So I could do that. Right? But uh, it's painful. I would just like to put down the points and, and a curve, a piecewise polynomial curve would come down, and it would be smooth. I don't have to worry about where I put the control points. And that's the thing about these points. They're piecewise polynomials, and uh, they're, they're piecewise, so it's local. You don't have one piece defining the entire car. And it doesn't matter where you put the control points, it's automatically smooth. Unlike Bezier curves, where the pieces have to be joined magically. So let's look at some examples just to convince ourselves. Here's the Bessier curve. And let's say if I move this control point over here, this one, look at this end here, it will affect the entire curve. Maybe it only affects that a little bit, but it affects, it affects the entire curve. Let's try the same thing with these lines. This is a corresponding beast line. Look over here, move this point, you see nothing happens over, over uh, the far end, nothing happens. I move this point, nothing happens over here. So if I'm happy with my design over here, I can try to change my design over here, and I won't affect what goes on over here. Now this is not one polynomial, this is many polynomials strung together, about three of them, but you can't tell, it looks completely smooth. Here's another example. Here's a Bezier curve, I think it's a degree six Bezier curve. I move this point, it's going to affect what goes there a little bit. So it's global control. Also, it doesn't look like such a great curve. Here's the corresponding beast line. It's much better. Now, if I move this curve, you'll see nothing happens over here. If I move this point, nothing happens. So imagine this is the trunk of the car, and you're happy, and this is the hood of the car, and you're trying to affect that, or change that, but you don't want to affect what goes on here. Well, that works. So how do we make these lines? How do we make these points? So that's the idea. That's why, but not how. Um, yeah, this is why we have to be with Bezier. Remember that we could get smooth things, but then the Q points were constrained. The P's could be anywhere, but then this Q was constrained to lie along these lines. The Q was also constrained. We don't want to constrain anything. We just want to curve this smooth no matter where I put the P's in. That's the idea of these points. Of course, we use velocity. <laughs> All right, so we remind you about velocity one more time. This is an identity. This is a multi affine property. It just says T is written this way. I can expand by the multi affine property. This is the multi affine property. This is how I write it. So instead of writing the P's, I just write that. And the mnemonic is if I multiply this by AA, right, I would get this formula. This formula is the same. Alright. Now, that's the Dicastro algorithm in terms of blasting. And we're just going to change this just a little bit to get these lines. The thing about the Dicastro algorithm it comes from this. You have A's and B's and nothing else. Now the important thing is that two of these are the same, so they come up, and then the different one is interpolated. But we can do this more generally. See, two of these are the same. T2 and T3, they come up and T. One and two are different than the triplets. We use this identity, and we use this multi-affine property. Again, if we multiply this by t2, t3, we get this identity. So this is the same as this identity. So instead of a's and b's, now we have these t's, and there are lots of them. And the t's are called knots. So we're going to just use this again and again and again. This is linear interpolation. It's all linear interpolation. That's all we have. So here's that linear interpolation right here. And now we can change, instead of 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, we have 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5. So we just change every index by 1. So this is a 4, this is a 5, this is a 1, this is a 2. You get this. Again, you shift every index by 1, you get this. And now you do it again, and you do it again. And this has an end. This is the Debord algorithm. Now this algorithm, this just gives you a polynomial, right? So all you're doing is multiplication and addition. So this is a single polynomial. And we're going we're gonna to restrict t to be between t3 and t4, because if you do that, then all these functions are non-negative. So you get convex combinations. But again, it's only a single polynomial, and I promised you a piecewise polynomial. Right? 
your single time up here. So I need to show you how to make the next piece. This is a piece between T4, T3, and T4. I need to show you how to make the piece between T4 and T5, and then between T5 and T6. Look here. Oops, okay. Look here again. I'm going to shift every index by one. So if I shift every index by one, then I get this. Here I had one, two, three. Now I have two, three, four. Here I had four. Now I have five. Right? So I've just shifted every index by one. And now this is the segment between T4 and T5. Now the idea is that these two segments must meet, and they must meet smoothly. Right? So I don't want to be able to tell where one, one stops and one starts. Now here are the piece together. You see, here's, here's the segment between T3 and T4. Here's the one between T4 and T5. Remember, I just shifted indices. So what's sitting over here is identical. It's identical. So the segment between T3 and T4, between T4 and T5. Let's just check that they actually meet at T4. What happens at T4? At T4, this is 0. This is 1. Because remember, there's a denominator here. Is, uh, is T4 minus T3. I think we bought the denominator. So this is 1, so the value here is the same as the value here. This is 0, this is 1, so the value here is the same as here, same as here. So yeah, at T4 they actually meet. But I have to show you more than that. I have to show you they actually meet smoothly. We'll come back to that in a minute. At least they meet. Now, let's see. Uh, so, so the things. So the T's are called knots, because say at T4 you're switching from one polynomial to another. That's called a knot. Uh, and the uh, the, the uh, control point is by the loss and evaluated at the knots consecutively. That's just what we see from the algorithm. Okay, so basically, this was a knot. These are the control points. Now, this is a knot. These are the control points. Okay, let's see. This algorithm again. Of course, we can do as many segments as we like. I'm just showing you two. Next segment, we patch here and then here. Okay, uh, before I go on to prove that they're smooth, how do you remember all the indices? Again, it's easy. If you look at an arrow, see the four here? Whatever comes in, comes out. Whatever comes in, comes out. Three, three, three. So again, the numerators are the same. The denominators are different. But whatever comes into a node comes out in the same direction. That's one way to remember. Now, how do you remember? So if you can remember what goes down here, then you can just follow the arrows. You know what goes up there. How do you remember what comes down here? Well, at P2, see, this 2 is the same as that 2. So that's easy to remember. And this 6, how do you get 6? 2 plus 3 plus 1. Why 3? 3 is the degree. So you take the index, you add the degree, and then you add one more. You add the degree, and then you add one more. That's the, that's the label. This is the same. And you add the degree, and you add one more. And that's what's on the bottom. And if you know what's on the bottom, it's easy to label the rest. OK. So, uh, OK, it's numerically stable because I'm taking convex combinations. Uh, it's going to be smooth. I'll show you that in a minute. In fact, I think I can show you that next. How do I know this is smooth? So we already said at T, T4, they meet continuously. They go through the same value. Now, to get the derivative, what do we get, have to do? We have to insert delta. Right? The derivative is TT delta. TT delta, right? So I have to get this delta here. Now, delta, remember, is uh, so T4 minus T1 divided by T4 minus T1. So this says I subtract T4 and T1, and then plus off the denominator, so it's there. So that's how you get delta in. And then you continue from here. Okay. So here's the first derivative for this segment, and here's the first derivative for that segment. What happens at T4? At T4, that's 0, that's 1, these values are the same. That's 0, that's 1, these values are the same. So yeah, at T4, the derivatives meet, the derivatives agree. What about two derivatives? Well, you need two deltas. So you do two deltas, and you differentiate that level, that level. Here you are. What happens at T4? That's 0, that's 1. These are the same. That's 0, that's 1. These are the same. So it makes the two derivatives. Of course, the third derivative, you'll kill off this level, and the argument won't work anymore. But if you have cubics, you don't expect them to be with three derivatives, because that would be the same polynomial on both sides. What it says is automatically, wherever I put these control points down here, these curves are going to meet with two continuous derivatives. Once you have curves with two continuous derivatives, typically you can't tell where one polynomial starts and where the other one begins. It doesn't matter where you put the control points. Okay. So we have nice properties. These are now piecewise polynomials for each of these 
diagrams, you get a piece, you put it, tack on more pieces on either side, it still works. Uh, you have continuity of order, well, mu here is 1, so if you're a degree n, you have continuity of order n minus 1. You can have multiple knots and reduce the continuity, so we won't talk about that. The curves of the convex follow their control points. Uh, you have local control. If you move a point, it only affects things locally. Right? If I move, say, this point, it won't affect what goes on here. If I move this point, it will affect both these segments, but it won't affect the next segment. So you have this kind of local control. So where am I? No, I think that's it. So, uh, okay, so there's all kinds of things one can prove, uh, but I think this might be a good place to, uh, to stop. So there is something that you know, has to replace uh, subdivisions called map assertion. It has to be surfaces. There's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, but I think, uh, at least I hope I've given you some of the highlights of what goes on with these pyramid algorithms. So they're all kind of the same. They're all linear interpolation, just variations on a theme. And uh, the fact that these, from these lines, that the pyramids fit together, of course, mimics the fact that the curves fit together. The curves, curves fit together smoothly. The pyramids fit together nicely. That's what happens. One can do similar things with surfaces. There are pyramid algorithms for Spezier surfaces and for tensor product piece lines. And again, now you get pyramids that these were kind of triangles. And of course, for surfaces, you actually get pyramids. So you get tetrahedra, you get polyhedra. And these pyramids will fit together and they'll have nice subdivision properties, etc., etc. But for that, we'll have to. So I think I'll stop here and I'll be happy.